experience um, her physiological other than the medical education aspect she has expertise in yoga and stress physiology she is president of association of physiologists of tamil nadu is a member of meu and uh, department of educational unit at our institute uh, she has also done acme which is a prime thing as per the nmc protocol she has 35 publications in national and international journal to her credit and three book chapters as well she has been a phd guide for five of the projects out of which two have been completed and three still going on and um, various aspects of uh, projects which she is going uh, some of which are like remedial programs for slow learners in preclinical phase then case based learning in an integrated preclinical curriculum and cultural competency among the interns these are just few of the project which she, uh, she is still moving on uh the topic what uh, this time we have chosen it's very interesting in a way that this is a need of our for every speciality specifically uh when nmc is forcing and focusing mainly on alignment and integration vertical horizontal in both the ways so we found that this is uh, the right platform to talk more about uh, integrated teaching and dr dilara she, since she has worked or for this this particular concept since years together i i know it from 2012 itself as a famous uh, project but she has been in integrated approach of teaching learning within her institute much before that so i found her to be the apt person to share her views for the topic uh, of integrated teaching welcome dr dilar thank you pooja uh, good evening uh thank you so much uh, all of you the appi gujarat chapter all the members for joining for this uh, webinar uh we are in uh, may and uh, i think the entire country is uh, being torn down by this uh, sweltering heat and so it is very nice of you people to join in the middle of may the evening for this uh, particular webinar thank you pooja for that introduction and uh, thanks for giving me a chance to speak in this webinar Perfect. and uh, i have always been uh, fascinated by your steadfast admiration for integrated teaching and it has remained uh, steadfast so so we can see here this this is a very small uh, integration which is over here physiology pathology medicine so as uh, dr pooja said uh, i will be telling some thoughts about my experience on integrated teaching so this is a reflection so when we reflect we look back to go forward so normally we look at the rear view we look at the rear view window so that we get a good idea of what is lay, lays ahead in front of us okay so reflection is actually a good exercise i think the cbme talks a lot about reflection it is not about stagnating or admir admiring whether we have done something well or if you have not done done something well also to review it and move forward that is the idea of looking back to move forward so throughout this uh, particular talk i'll be talking about certain concepts in integrated teaching and as i am talking i will be reflecting on my experiences and towards the end we will take a few questions therefore the objectives upon this session would be at the end of the session we will be able to review the history definition principles and levels of integrated teaching in medical education give the need for integrated teaching in medical education discuss the various teaching learning strategies what are the modules incorporating integrated teaching discuss the applica application of integrated teaching learning methods present in the current cbme or the competency based medical education in india reflect on integrated teaching learning methods in alignment with specific institutional curricular goals that means you will be able to think of integrated teaching learning methods which can suit your institution and describe the challenges in integrated teaching and finally explore some approaches to integrated assessment so let's go 
into the history a little bit. This is during the Hippocrates time. So when the practice and education of medicine started long back, maybe somewhere in the 13th century or the 14th century, all the medical students and doctors were polymaths till the industrial revolution. Now, who is a polymath? A polymath is a person who has got a knowledge in different subjects, a knowledge in different subjects. That means a polymath is a person, basically a general practitioner. Okay? So I think integrated teaching somewhat is about making a person a general practitioner. But with the development of specializations and subspecializations, the curriculum, the medical curriculum became centrifugal or instead of concentrating on a holistic learning, it branched out. Then came the Flexner report in the 1900s, that is 1910 to be precise. Now that report said that to make medical learning more valid, it should become centripetal once again, to become centripetal once again. And many medical councils, including the General Medical Council from Britain, agreed on this. So they were thinking of various methods which could include reflective learning, self-directed learning, problem solving, and most important, integrating basic sciences with clinical sciences. Therefore, they said that integrated curriculum is one approach which will which will satisfy this particular need. The, the curriculum which has branched out too much so that the students are not getting a holistic idea to make it centripetal once again, we can have an integrated curriculum. So therefore, we have many national bodies, including our National Medical Council and the postgraduate programs and employers from various private from various private institutions. So our graduates, they pass out and they go to one of the either join a PG program and they join an institution. But these graduates, they need to keep pace with the clinical demands. That's very important. But the Flexner report, after the Flexner report, it it told the traditional curriculum. The traditional curriculum is basically two plus two. If you look at the curriculum, the first two years is we study basic sciences. The first year we study biochemistry, physiology, anatomy. Then the microbiology, pharmacology, pathology. These are also considered basic sciences. Then we have clinical sciences, the next two. All our OBG, surgery, medicine, ENT, ophthal, etc. Okay. So that is a traditional curriculum which was designed as per the Flexner report. And this is being adopted to a large extent throughout the word. But again, this curriculum has been considered, many, there are many review literature saying that this is inadequate for the 20, 21st century medical practice by Cook et al. Why is it so? Because the students need a transdisciplinary knowledge. If you take many things like health policies, health promotion or health economics, so many things need a transdisciplinary knowledge, which is beyond the basic and applied sciences. Something they need much more beyond what is being taught in these subjects. Now, there is a Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching. Now, this foundation was, this is the one which released the Flexner report. Interestingly, it, it came out with terminology such as ossified curricular structures, ossified curricular structures. That means old curricular structures and very archaic assessment practices. That is very ancient assessment practices. We have this International Association of Medical Sciences Education. So they reviewed the Flexner model for about 100 years. And they came out that they came out with the suggestion that an integrated curriculum is a good model to satisfy the needs of today's society, the, the medical, the health needs of today's society. So the first integrated curriculum, which is the, which is, was introduced in the McMaster University, Canada in the year 
1989. This was popularly called as the McMaster curriculum and uh, many, many medical schools has been adopting this particular curriculum. So this was the first curriculum. Now let us look at some of the definitions. So it was been in the year 1977 who first reviewed integrated curricula in general education. Then came the Harden. We all know about Harden, the Harden ladder in 1984. He said that integration is organization of teaching to interrelate or unify subjects which are taught in separate courses or department. He gave the definition for integration in medical education. Now, Raja C. Bandar Naike, he is also a doyen in medical education. He worked in uh, Gulf Medical College in Ajman. And my previous uh, vice chancellor, Dr. Rangasamy, also worked with uh, him. And they developed an integrated curriculum there. So his definition was, integration is not summation, but rather the harmonization of already exist by existing parts into a meaningful composite. So this definition is very easy for us to remember. It is just the sum of interrelated parts to make a meaningful whole. Okay. So all these definitions, all these concepts are very important when we are trying to implement integrated teaching. Now we should clarify what is not integration or what cannot be integration. Integration of discrete topics within a course. For example, if I'm going to introduce a skills module or say if I'm going to introduce a CPR module or even introduce an ethics module, a separate module, which is discrete, which does not include any, anat any elements of anatomy, physiology, the first year or microbiology, etc. Now that cannot be integration. Okay. Integrating one separate courses or clinical experiences. We all we all have a pre-university course that is called as PUC, long back we had. Now that cannot be, that we put that pre-university course in front of MBBS, we cannot call that as integration. That had statistics, physics, chemistry, etc. Now also we have a foundation course, okay? Now when we put a foundation course in front of MBBS, that cannot be called as integration. This is not, uh, these are not my definitions. These are uh, taken from, I'll show you the references later. Okay. And early clinical exposure again will not fall under the definition of integration. Now, there has been lots of confusion about early clinical exposure. Early clinical exposure doesn't mean taking the first year student and asking him to stand around a patient, take history from a patient, not, uh, not expecting him to do what a third year medical student is expected to do. Early clinical exposure means the student goes to the hospital, learns the working environment of the hospital, how is the OP patient getting registered, how is an inpatient getting registered, what is the architecture of a operation theater like? These are some of the elements of early clinical exposure. So therefore, Early clinical exposure, again, will not comprise integration. Now, coming to some of the theories and principles of integration. So, what is the basis for this integration? Now, as I am talking, I'll be telling you about some of our, some of my experiences. We all know about andragogy by knowledge. So, there are many andragogy or adult learning principles. So, one of the principles which goes with integrated teaching is the student, an adult learner, learns best when he is told the relevance of why he is learning a particular thing. That is, when particularly an adult learner, he has got very little exposure to the clinical side. So when we link the basic sciences to the clinical sciences, the student, it is said that when that relevance is provided, a student is able to learn better. Now, this has been done by various methods such as case-based learning, problem-based learning, etc. My institution adopted a case-based learning method. There's a slight difference between case-based learning and problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is more difficult. A problem is given. A, a student works on the problem over a period of weeks or months. And problem-based learning is usually taken as a small group. Case-based learning can be taken as both large group and small group. Here a case is introduced at the beginning of say a module or a lecture 
for a series of lectures and all those teaching learning methods are connected to a case. But problem based learning is different. The problem is put in front of the student and the student is asked to work through the problem and other other teaching or other help is given in between as the student solves the problem. Now, the other thing is psychologists say that as per the cognitive theory, when we provide a context to the learning, why are we learning this particular thing? How best we are going able to learn this? A student is able to organize the learning better. So therefore, this helps in long-term retention and understanding and deeper understanding. Therefore, integration as per the cognitive theory, providing an integrated teaching is going to facilitate learning for the adult learner. The other thing is, the third thing is the transfer of learning. So we all learn the basic sciences so that we are able to remember, not forget the basic sciences, transfer the learning when we see a patient. So transfer of learning occurs better in integration. The student is able to apply concepts when he sees a patient as a final year student or during clerkship. The other thing is the Bloom's taxonomy in 1956. When Bloom introduced taxonomy, he said the three domains. But when we take the traditional curriculum, these domains are fragmented. If I am, if I am correct, in the first two years, the more importance is given to the cognitive, to the knowledge domain. In the rest of the years, the more, uh, more importance is given to the clinical domain and the attitudinal domain. But whereas in integration, we try to integrate these domains as well, instead of keeping it fragmented as in the traditional curriculum. Therefore, our MM, MMC also brought in the curricular uh, implementation support program in 2015 and the competency-based medical education was rolled out in 2019 as well. Now, let us look at some of these models. Now, Fostati Young in the year 2000, he gave a simple model. One is ideas. Ideas is what we give in the basics course. That is the foundation. Ideas is what we teach them in anatomy, physiology, etc. Then, that is, we teach them the normal. Then we try to connect the deviations. What happens in pathology when this goes wrong? When, say, when a microorganism attack, what happens? That is, the student tries to make connections. Extension is application of these, the both the clinical and the basic sciences in patient encounters. So he gave this simple program. He gave the simple model, ideas, connections and extensions, okay? You can see that these are all interrelated. One of the basic principles of integration is we should never forget our basic sciences. The student should never forget the basic science. Now coming to Harden, Harden actually gave a framework of how we should carry on with integration. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this Harden step. So he gave this 11 step approach. So according to Harden, this integration is a continuum. Okay, it starts from isolation, awareness, etc., goes to the transdisciplinary uh, phase. The first four steps they emphasize on the discipline, whereas the next six steps is integration across disciplines. The last is the complete integration. We'll see this again. So we all know. I think uh, most of us know isolation taught in isolation, is isolated uh, compartments where, uh, where faculty are not aware of what is happening in the other department. Awareness is, okay, I understand that this will be taught in anatomy in, in, so as a physiologist. Okay, this will be repeated in anatomy, but still I'm taking it as a separate subject. Harmonization, I make an attempt to harmonize, I know, but still it is discrete. Nesting is when little bit of other subjects I include in my temporal coordination is when I place the subjects next to each other. For example, if I'm going to, the anatomist is going to talk about the anatomy of the respiratory tract, I will be talking about mechanical ventilation. So it's like that. We just place together. And sharing is when we decide to take topics together. For example, acid-base balance. So this is going to reduce redundancy and duplication. Say the anatomist and the biochemist, we come together and we share a program. Correlation is when we introduce a subject. 
when you introduce something else okay for example a clinical subject is introduced and there is a correlation of it complementary program now that subject becomes assumes a greater significance you can see over here this pink is actually the subject which tries to integrate the basic sciences and as it becomes this pink keeps on increasing it keeps on gaining importance and in the transdisciplinary phase it is only the pink which is predominant that means say for example a student will be in the transdisciplinary phase a student will be studying only about diseases he will not be studying anatomy physiology or even surgery medicine he will be studying anemia neoplasia uh, say hemiplegia coronary artery disease bronchial asthma now that is very difficult right it will be against the it is not there in our council but it has been tried in some medical colleges coming to this transdisciplinary phase is very difficult it was tried in the dundee curriculum that the student learned about 113 cases okay but our our national medical council and in the current cbme it emphasizes only on temporal coordination sharing little bit of nesting little bit of correlation if needed and we need to integrate only 20 percent of our curriculum okay so this full integration is not possible now some of the curricular models we know about i'll be telling a little bit about the horizontal integration vertical integration etc now this helps to visualize the current and the integrated intended curriculum first to start implement any curriculum we should visualize what is our current curriculum so we have two reference points one is a time and the subjects now we know what is this horizontal curriculum horizontal is when i try to integrate across one particular phase say anatomy physiology biochemistry if if i we want to take a subject to gather okay it could be bronchial asthma it could be coronary artery disease it could be hemiplegia like the anatomist will be talking about the descending tracts i'll be talking about the function the biochemist will be talking about some metabolic disorders which can influence hemiplegia similarly take a case of covid okay if horizontal integration is taken then the microbiologist will take, talk about the virus etc then the pathologist will talk about the what are the pathological manifestations of covid and the pharmacologist will talk about what is the treatment for covid that is the horizontal integration vertical integration is if i am going to ask the pharmacologist to talk about say about the pharmacotherapy of hemiplegia then that becomes vertical integration i'm going to bring a clinician in asking him to bring, talk about the clinical features of hemiplegia then that becomes vertical integration okay and uh, this is another model uh, which was proposed in the netherlands so they say that this is the traditional curriculum where there's a total cutoff between the clinical practice and the basic sciences so here this is an z shape model you can see over here is in this typical integration what happens is in the initial years the basic science is more but there is clinical teaching as well but in the later years you have clinical practices there but there is basic science too okay that means the student has to visit the basic science again. Okay. So this is what the spiral curriculum says. Spiral curriculum is a combination of horizontal integration, vertical integration, and the student visiting the basic sciences again. That is when the student goes to the final year, a basic scientist or a physiologist and anatomist, we go take a class again for them. And in our institution, we had elements of horizontal integration, vertical integration, and spiral integration, spiral curriculum as well. For example, we when I took coronary artery disease module for phase two, in phase two, I went and took about the physiology of the vascular endothelium. I was a first year teacher. I went and took physiology of the vascular endothelium. Okay. So I'll I'll tell you more examples about this. So this was the spiral model was followed by in the Dundee curriculum, as I said, which had a full triple transdisciplinary model in 1997. So they defined it as 
a fully synchronous transdisciplinary delivery of information between the foundation courses and the applied sciences throughout all years of the medical school curriculum now we should we should uh, think that this is not possible or a fully integrated curriculum is not possible so what is possible for us is having integrated modules or integrated clerkships or just some pockets of integrated teaching okay so in my experience we followed vertical integration horizontal integration and spiral integ spiral integration also now how do we implement integration now there is no literature says that there is no standard instruction but how do we go we can review all this knowledge and the theories which i have told you so far and there are plenty of literature on the challenges and there are tips also which i'll be telling later about how to implement a curriculum the most important thing is you have to look at your own curriculum for example the anatomist the physiologist and the biochemist has to sit together what are we taking now what is possible to integrate okay for example like if i want to take a module on coronary artery disease i am taking cardiovascular system at one point of time and the dissection of the thoracic cavity is happening at some other point of time both of us can sit together and think how can we bring this together or say if i want to take a module on hemiplegia i am taking cns at one point of time and the anatomist is dissecting out the brain at another point of time and the biochemist is taking the lipoprotein metabolism or the all about the sphingolipids and the sphingomyelins at some other point of time we three sit together and decide how can we bring this together how can we first temporarily coordinate a small module we can start say five day module or 10 day module so there should be some transparency there should be some transparency and we should be able to demonstrate links that is what is happening when it is happening how is it happening or are the students really learning so we should just think about this we we'll start we have to start with about 5 days or 10 days the spices model is another interesting model i'll come to it now what does this spices model says now i i'm sure all of you know the spices model now what is important in this model is not every medical college should move about everything s p i c e s not all of us should move to the to, uh, towards the spices side right it is not possible also that is not required also right we should every medical college has to decide how much of our teaching should be student centric that's important how much of our teaching then how much of our teaching should be problem based and again every medical college should decide how much of our teaching should be integrated i think the nmc has does, done that job for us it has decided 20% of the teaching has to be integrated so we need not worry our entire curriculum need not be integrated and we can choose whether we want it to be integrated or community based there are some medical colleges like cmc vellore or where dr tripti is working the varda medical college where it's mostly community based okay so depending upon the institutional goals and whether we need electives or not and systematic i would say that most of our teaching should be systematic for example say at the end of the five and a half years i want all the students to secure an iv line that is systematic at the end of five and a half years all the students should secure an iv line it is not i am not leaving it to chance okay certain things it has to be systematic but rest of the spices model it depends upon the goals of the institution so always look for synchronous presentation of material in an integrated curriculum like say as i told you like i'll be showing an infertility model also like supposing the anatomist has to talk about the supports of the uterus before i go into the menstrual cycle and there is very little scope for biochemistry coming over here in certain things for example if i talk about the git yes the anatomist can talk about the dissection and the histology of the git etc i can talk about the digestion process and the biochemist has got a great role to play because they'll be talking about uh, carbohydrate metabolism etc so we have to, i have to present this material in a very synchronous manner that's very important and usually this happens when we talk about integration we tend to neglect the basic sciences 
So in our experience, like when external examiners came, they gave us this feedback that your students are talking lots of basics and lots of clinical sciences. Okay. They seem to talk a little bit of uh, basic sciences. They talk more clinical sciences. And um, when uh, when we analyzed our results, the pass percentage was the same. But the number of people who have got the higher marks was more. They were writing, they were writing lots of clinical stuff in their papers. So literature says that basic science is very important. One of the criteria of an integrated curriculum is the student should revisit the basic science again and again. So in our quest for integrated teaching, we should not leave off the basic sciences. The other thing is we should use these unified concepts. Lots of like what I told you, like what is not integration, what is integration, what is the standard definition for integration. We should go by these unified concepts. That way we will not lose track. Now, how did, how did we start and proceed? I'm coming to my experience. Now, we started with a model called as professional development. This is similar to our ADCOM. Because straight away, if we ask the faculty to integrate uh, anatomy, physiology, etc., they will not. It's very difficult to integrate them. So this was started way back, I think, in 2003, 2004, 20 years back. So we took topics like breaking bad news or, uh, say, renal transplantation, which is a, which is a common topic. So all faculty came together for discussing this as a small group for assessing students. That way, the preclinical faculty and the clinical faculty first we got to know each other because by taking some different topic so first the faculty became integrated first we did not uh, like we did not know the clinicians the clinical clinicians uh, um, they did not know that basic science people existed as well okay so we came to know each other through that after that there are about nine topics, the medical education unit, like iron deficiency, anemia, coronary artery disease, bronchial asthma, etc. They chose about nine from the global burden of diseases. These were taken. So they were take, they were considered fit for integration. And committees were developed. For example, coronary artery disease committee, bronchial asthma committee. And in this committee, there was one physiologist, anatomist, biochemist, etc. And our roles were defined. We started with coronary artery disease block in phase one, that is in 2006. And uh, this was extended to phase two, and we started bronchial asthma in phase one and phase two. Now this, our, uh, this, uh, this block, this integrated block, it started with the case. We had hospital visits in between, and uh, the case was resolved at the end of the module, and we had formative assessment. That is, we saw how the student discussed the case, and we had multiple choice questions also. Now, we started with an organ based, organ system based integration phase one. That means it was called as a cardiovascular block. In that cardiovascular block, we had anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, etc. It was a disease based integration phase two. It was called as a neoplasia block or a genetics block in phase two. Then, symptom based integration. In now, that means if I take a case of pain in a pain abdomen, there will be a surgical cause of pain abdomen, there will be a medical cause of pain abdomen, there will be an OG cause of pain abdomen. So with that pain abdomen, that symptom, we can integrate. So in our experience, integration can be maximum in the first phase. About 60% integration can take place. In phase two, that is pathology, you can have about 40% integration. When we come to the clinical sciences, Integration will be less because already the student is getting branching out into various specialties. Okay. We also had dental caries, cleft lip modules in dentistry. Now, later on, entire curriculum has integrated elements. I will not say as per the previous definition, our curriculum fitted into an integrated curriculum, the standard thing. Our entire curriculum has integrated elements. Now, look at this. This is our coronary artery disease phase one curriculum in 2006. So this was a five-day module. 
Now, the first day, it started with the cardiologist, okay? The cardiologist tells that why coronary artery disease is important, what's the role of a cardiologist. Then it was followed by the introduction of a case. In the case was a simulated case, that is, a, 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 say, a 60-year-old man, obese gentleman, hypertensive, he comes with a history of an anginal pain, his, uh, what is his ECG finding, what is his lipid profile like, all that. It is a simulated case, okay? That is given. Then this, we had 150 students at that point of time. They were divided into three batches and one batch went for dissection of the dissection. Another batch, conduction system was taken and ECG was taken. This was an active learning center. That is, uh, the students, they'll be working on computers. They'll be fixing, like it'll be sort of a game. They can fix the ECG lead to a patient, okay? That kind of an active learning center. And another group went to histology. So this was rotated for about three days. Then after this practical activity, there was again a lecture on heart as a pump. That is, entire thing, we, they were briefed about cardiac output, cardiac cycle, etc. But these students already, this cardiovascular system and dissection was over. Okay, I should tell that because, and this block was a kind of a summary for them. Later, when we totally integrated, this block was extended. Okay, when it became a cardiovascular block, this particular block was extended. So we started this as a five-day module. After this, students were shown ultrasonography of the heart, Doppler studies, etc. They were divided into three batches. One batch went to see a treadmill about what happens during what happens, what was the response to hypoxia, what happens to the ECG. The other, they had a practical on lipid metabolism. Then the next day was taken the special features of coronary circulation. Then, so we had a cardiology, medicine, physiology, you can see biochemistry, you can see anatomy. Then epidemiology, community medicine came in. Now that tells the student the importance of coronary artery disease. Okay. So after this, this case was divided into two things. Okay. Two parts. What will happen? So what will happen if the student, the patient is exposed to a treadmill? We stopped over there. Now, after undergoing the treadmill, the case to part two was resumed. Okay. So provided this patient had a coronary artery disease, then what will happen? Then how do we diagnose? What are the ECG symptoms? A medicine person came and took that. And other thing is the ethical aspects of it. How to treat a cardiac patient? Again, a person from an emergency came and taught the students about like how should a family be treating a cardiac patient, etc. And then we go to prevention, early prevention, prevascularization, all these lectures was taken and time was given for self-study as well. Then again, the, the students resolved the case, the part two of the case as a small group. Then we had an assessment through MCQs and some OSPI stations also, that is say, uh, a specimen of a thrombus was kept and a K, like the students were asked to do some biochemical, usual, the usual biochemical test which they do in the first year, all that was also done. And finally, they had a meeting, we had a feedback. This is how our blog started, a five-day module started. I hope I have told something about how we did, okay? So now the, now the case, the NMC calls it as a linker, okay? So this linker, this case, we, sp we spread it vertically across all faces. Like it's a simulated case. I write a case intentionally so that it has elements, it has scope for discussion of physiology, biochemistry, etc. When this case moves to the next phase, I will tell that the same person who came with the, say with the anginal pain, he has got a block in this artery and he has got a thrombus, etc. So that will enable me to discuss pathology. Then he was relieved, the pain was relieved on giving nitri nitrates. That will enable me to discuss pharmacology. Okay. That then I will build up the complexity of the case as I go to the medicine, surgery, etc. So for everything, the complexity of the case will increase as per the needs of the phase. And it's very important. The case has to be written by a first year. It's better a basic science person writes it. 
say if i give the give the case to to be written by an endocrinologist he will not be understanding the needs of phase one let it be simple then the faculty will get an ownership they will get a sense of accomplishment okay i will tell you that integrated teaching like uh, like many curricular innovations it is not that easy okay but anyway it can be done we can make a small beginning and every institution can boast of some beginning, something theirs. Now, I'll tell you about this uh, link curve which we developed for infertility. So, initially, it will be like an infertile, infertile couple comes to a doctor. Then the doctor asks for the menstrual history. So, I can teach the menstrual cycle along with that. Okay. Then the doctor orders for investigation, seminars, etc. Then I can go to the male reproductive system along with that. So, with all this, if a small case, I can teach the anatomy and the physiology of the female reproductive tract. There's very little scope for biochemistry over here. At the most, we can talk about some antioxidant drugs we can talk. Okay. So, every integration will cannot involve all the three subjects. And that has to be a standalone subject. That's why NMC in his wisdom says only 20% integration. In phase two, the same case, I can say that this patient complains of a curdy white discharge and on ultrasound finding, the we further investigated this infertile couple. They seem to have a fibroadenoma, I mean, sorry, a leomyoma. Then that gives scope for pathology, okay? Histosalpingography and say the doctor puts the patient on ovulation-inducing drugs. We can develop the case like that. Then, then we can go into pharmacology, pathology, and any what are the infectious agents which can cause infertility in a couple. That, that way we can talk about these subjects. Then when I go to phase three, I can build up the case. I can tell that gynecologist starts the patient on follicular monitoring, intrauterine insemination, uh, intracytes, cytoplasmic sperm insemination. All this, I can build up the complexity of the case and I can discuss phase three okay. also. So this is how... This is our timetable for where we have incorporated infertility. So you can see wherever ITO infertility has come. So there's a case introduction over here, then embryology of the testis, etc. Then there's a dissection, male genital dissection, which is taken by anatomy. So histology of the male genital system. So like this, you can see wherever this ITO is being given, spermatogenesis, again, the student has learned about the, about the male reproductive system and we go, the physiologist takes about spermatogenesis. Like this, there will be a dissection, there will be a gross anatomy and the histology of the reproductive system and we will follow it up with functions, okay? And see, there is an integrated seminar as well where all the specialists will be sitting together. This will be done by a student and it will be moderated by a gynecologist. Okay. This is the actual timetable. This is coming in the reproduction block. Over here as well. And finally, we introduce that case. That case will be resolved by an ogician. By an ogician and and marks will be and multiple choice questions will be there. And that will be taken for, uh, they'll be taken for the formative assessment. This is in phase one. Now, when this case, as I told you, when it moves to phase two, this is actually in microbiology. Okay, see, this block is called as reproductive system, infertility, breast, bone, joint, etc. So, again, this case is introduced. And you can see that microbiology comes over here. Like, like even if the patient is suffering for, from infer STD, the, that can be one of the causes for infertility. So we have to make a connect over here. And you can see diseases of the uterus, which is taken in pathology, that is connected, okay? Pharmacology, androgen, anabolic steroids, etc. So everywhere, like pharmacology, what are the drugs to treat STD or what are the ovulation induce and inducing drugs? All this has to be interrelated. And finally, there is a case resolution and feedback. We just... I think this is given in the ITO module, which has been published by the NMC also, how you can put it together. The only thing over here is the disadvantage over here is like a traditional curriculum, we will not have all the subjects on the same day on the same hour also. So that will be disturbed. Like one day, pharmacologists can have plenty of classes. One day, the pathologists can have plenty of classes. It is depending upon what is the need for the integration. Okay. So when 
when we came to final year look at this all this was the case was introduced with the increasing complexity as i said then what is family planning and infertility what are the causes for management of female infertility artificial reproduction techniques surgical causes of infertility both in male and the female infertility dealt together and finally there is a case resolution again so the same case is spread over the over all the three phases this is how currently we are doing uh, integration i have taken i have just taken an example of infertility we are doing it for coronary artery disease bronchial asthma thyroid hypothyroidism so many things we are doing i think i have about 14 15 more slides okay now coming to so far we have taken about uh, i have told you about the process of integration now let us go little bit into how assessing integration now assessment is the most difficult part assessing traditional curriculum itself is very difficult assessing an integrated curriculum or integrated teaching becomes even more difficult now what is the principle is is assessing how the students use the basic science content when they do a clinical reasoning that is theory or how they are able to apply the basic science when they are doing a clinical skill we have to assess both together that is the principle of assessment of an uh, assessment and integration this was told by kulasegaram et al so basically we are going to assess how the student is going to apply the theory to practice so some of the tools which has been given in literature is reflection questions i think uh, writing a reflection itself is something uh, very difficult assessing re reflection is uh, even more difficult we need to have some standardized assessment methods okay so we need to decide on how to assess that reflection say a student has seen a patient uh, encounter then you should ask him basic science questions clinical then ask him to write a reflection we have to grade it and give the comments as well multiple choice questions essays etc can be given and clinical reasoning exercise ask him to give write a paragraph about uh, uh, why he feels that this could be the reason on how we can apply the basic science diagnostic uh, justification exercise that is the student is asked about his various differential diagnosis and why he feels so and how he is able to apply basic science over there concept maps many people uh, use concept maps and again we have to care, be careful about concept map because the students concept of concept map may be different from the teachers concept of concept map okay so so the concept maps will tell about uh, the pathogenesis problem based learning etc so many literature says that this is useful when we ask students to draw concept maps that's easy and mind map assessment rubric it takes to a higher level that is the student can introduce images etc and that can be assessed progress test this is what we this is the formative assessment the best calls is calls it a formative uh, progress test at the end of every week we can assess how the student is going higher up the group's taxonomy that is progress test open book exams so that will uh, give the student a, a scope for a very deep understanding clinical reasoning problem solving etc and assessment of this open book exams okay now i will tell you some of the some example share some of the examples now this is an integrated essay question define and describe the various bronco pulmonary segments now that is anatomy okay name some common pathological conditions with the which involves specific bronchopulmonary segments and give reasons for the same because in medicine there is a reason why a particular bronchopulmonary pulmonary segment gets affected and why certain uh, why particular uh, bacteria favor certain bronchopulmonary segment therefore we are involving these two departments and outline the surgical importance of bronchopulmonary segments we are involving surgery okay so this is actually an integrated essay question now a case based integrated free response or an essay question a 58 year old lady with emergency comes to uh, emergency with history of fever anorexia etc a provisional diagnosis of pancreatitis is made and this patient has had unrelenting abdominal pain about 2 months back 
in the right upper quadrant. The ultrasound shows gallstones without cystic duct obstruction at that point of time, two months back. Her serum amylase and lipase is grossly elevated. On the third day of hospitalization, the patient has hypotension, dyspnea, respiratory failure, etc. She needs mechanical ventilation. The X-ray chest shows adult respiratory syndrome. Okay, so, sorry, um, respiratory distress. Okay, so here the case-based integrated question is: Describe the mechanism by which gallstones cause pancreatitis pathology. Describe the normal secretion of bile physiology. Explain the race in enzyme values and give the normal values biochemistry. Correlate the upper quadrant pain with the ultrasound findings anatomist. And uh, what additional history, that is, whether there's a history of alcoholism or anything else, is a family history that comes under medicine, okay, or any additional investigations has to be done. Whether the serum calcium has measured, why it has to be measured, that is biochemistry. And give the reason for the ARDS in the above patient. So, Normally, it is said that this uh, the cytokines, etc., released, uh, they affect the uh, surfactant production. Okay, so that involves physiology, pathology, medicine, etc. Now, the problem is who is going to correct if we ask this particular question like this? But then this is a typical integrated question. And we can have an integrated MCQ. Like a heart failure patient comes with symptoms of shock with history of food poisoning. So we can ask one MCQ on physiology, what is the type of shock? And what is the kind of IV fluids we are going to administer? Pharmacology, right? Then what will happen if, if we are going to give 0.9% saline? What, that is hyperchloremic acidosis, okay? That is again pharmacology medicine. And since this is a heart failure patient, how, what will happen if there is a fluid overload, okay? What is the symptom? Again, this, I think this is quite easy to assess because uh, it can be a computerized assessment also. But then developing such a question is quite difficult. Now, you can see this integrated OSPI. A person comes with stab wound. That is give reason. What's the kind of stab wound? That is forensic medicine. You have penetrating stab wound and perforated wound, isn't it? That is for forensic medicine. What is this yellow discoloration, slough formation? What are the common pathogens, microbiology? What is the appropriate antibiotic? What systemic disorder can complicate diabetes? Give three, three specialty management. That is FM because this is a medical legal case, medicine, surgery. You can keep an OSP station in phase two like this. You can think about your own OSP stations. You can keep it for 10 marks or 20 marks or something like that. And you can assess it. And you can add this to a formal for your formative assessment as well. Integrated uh, clinical case is quite easy. What we do in our clinical side, we can develop uh, this one, a mini clinical exercise where you have to have questions on basic science. Okay, what, what is the basic science behind it? You can assess the clinical skills. Of course, we do that. And the clinical reasoning and attitudes can also be assessed. So some of the challenges are, it is highly resource intensive. Okay, resource intensive for the institution because faculty time is needed, faculty are needed. And faculty motivation, faculty need to be rewarded for that. There has to be a cooperation, there has to be a collaboration. And there is a fear of losing departmental boundaries. Okay, what I give up this, what I give up this topic. Okay, if I if I collaborate, then there is a fear of losing my department boundary and uh, there's a need to cross over specialty content like I need to learn a little bit of anatomy for this talk also I learned a little bit about medicine anatomy etc I had to learn okay so but then there's a specialist also for that okay now ensuring students compliance if we are not able to convince the student enough about uh, integrated teaching then it is going to be difficult now, unexpected changes in the timetable. Say we have we have we have developed a very good timetable, and a pandemic like COVID comes up, or there's a flood somewhere, then that then that everything goes uh, to a to a toss, goes for a six, isn't it? Somewhere even one day that integration is uh, the timetable goes haywire means then that integration will be lost. Mostly aligning assessment. A student is taught in an integrated fashion, then assessed in the traditional fashion, then uh, assessment uh, 
then the student will know that the student that the integration will fail. Now, who takes the responsibility for assessment? As I told you that how can I go and correct an OSPI which has got all FM, all the possible elements over there? Who's going to take a responsibility for that? Then the most important, you have developed all these things, then that should have proper weightage in the assessment. At the end of the day, that is not going to have a very small, minuscule weightage in the formative assessment. Then the student will know that also, that this is going, yeah. Evaluation and modification. Some of the tips are train the staff members, decide on the scope of integration, choose a level of integration, establish working groups, determine learning outcomes. This is given by Malik Etta. So benefits of integrated teaching, we have a proactive, competent learner. For faculty, it helps in career advancement. For the institution, it helps to remove redundancy. We are able to achieve outcomes and ultimately the patient, it is a satisfactory patient care. Therefore, to summarize, integrated teaching is a summation of integrated subjects. The composite whole is based on adult learning principles. It provides contextual learning, enhances transfer of learning. You have validated models which provide implementation. Institution, every institution has to decide on the scope and the levels of integration. So we have to balance validity and feasibility. If you are looking at an integrated product, then the process needs to be integrated as well. This is why Steve Jobs, he told for a business model, but then we can apply it for medical students too. So these are my references. I would like to say something about the last reference. I think Shaisa Syed is from Gujarat. And yes. uh, one thing impressed me, one thing impressed me, he said that uh, like inter the teachers were bossy, like when we introduced integration, they were very much right. Yes, sir. we need to have some friendliness when we are introducing innovations like innovations, like integrated teaching. It takes a lot of time. We have to train the uh, teachers for case-based writing, for case writing, for case resolution, objective writing, etc. It takes a long time. It is said that even the grave can be moved, but not the curriculum. So sometimes you have to look back to see how far you have come. So I thank my institution for giving me the experience in medical education and integrated teaching, and it has been a pleasure talking to you all. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much. It was so connected, and I just, I, not even for a second, I missed any point. I have many questions in my mind, but before I start uh, asking the questions, I would keep it open for the participants to start with the questions. You can unmute participants, dear participants, please unmute yourself to ask questions. Or you can write it on the chat. I'll read it. Any question? You can unmute yourself or you can write your question on the chat box. Anyone? Till we have the participant getting ready for the question. Okay, Hello. there's a question. There's a question. Uh, Hello, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Can I go ahead? So you're here? Yeah, please, please, please. Please, Dr. Suyo, please. Hello, Pooja, ma'am. Hope yeah. you're fine. And yeah, yeah. A very wonderful session. Thank you, uh, ma'am, for uh, enlightening us on integrated teaching. Um, I'm just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not a question really, but just to have a guidance. How far has this module that you have made been uh, successful in, at your place? Like, are all the faculty following the integrated teaching for the assessment as well, the clinical cases, as, as you talked about? So, is it being done at your place? Yeah, we are doing it. We are doing it. We have been doing from, I said, 2006, we introduced it as a small module. Then I think 2007-2008, we have uh, we have about, say, 25%, 30% of this uh, integration. Throughout the entire curriculum, we have been doing it. Doing it. Okay, ma'am. So are there any challenges faced during the assessment? Like you said, that's a big challenge. How Who will assess the questions on the integrated teaching? We sit and we assess together, like uh, the anatomist, the biochemist and all, we sit and assess together. Or sometimes if if they can give the key for that, we can assess. Okay, that, that's great. The person also. We need to collaborate. Mm, that's we true, ma'am. Of course, there will be some ego clashes. There will be That's some features and all. Plenty is there. 
Sure. But then uh, I think that's all a part of the game. And that's great. And this possible at your place that we can also make it possible. That's wonderful, ma'am. Congratulations, ma'am, for that. Thank you once again, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have two questions uh, on the chat box. One is, may I know when is integrated assessment done in which phase? That's the first question. I think probably they want to ask which phase the integrated assessment has to be done. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, Dilara, ma'am, can you just stop sharing the screen so that we can have the uh, full faces on the dais? Yes. Okay. okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, the question is, uh, may I know when is integrated assessment done in which phase? Probably what the participant is uh, trying to ask, uh, doctor. I think, uh, okay, uh, every phase it is done. At the end of each block, it is done. For example, we have five, we have cardiovascular block, respiratory system block in phase one, okay? Say at the end of one and a half months or two months, it is done. Okay. Uh, we we are we 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 are now. I think uh, MC also says that there should be an integrated question in your university exam too. Okay. So we can uh, like for example, I can keep the same case as a chart in my practical examination. The same case which I discussed, I can keep it in my university. We keep physiology charts, isn't it? I can yeah. keep it there. Yeah. So that way I can assess. So it is. Uh, it's being done at the end of every every module, every block, it is being done. Say that means, uh, say every phase, the student gets about five or six formative assessments, which has this integrated elements. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Uh, Ma'am, any suggestions to overcome the challenges? Actually, you can uh, read, I, for want of time, I didn't go through that. Dr. Malik has given uh, from Malaysia, he has written that challenges, tips for this one. Uh, suggestions to overcome the challenges. Uh, see, the fact, the one thing is, uh, this is, I think, a, a problem, I, I think, in India, that, that is, there is no motivation or reward for teaching, etc. So, we need to reward the faculty, motivate the faculty, I don't know if I talk about rewards, I think that will be another topic. Uh, we, we need to come together and uh, it will take some time. Supposing we can we have to conduct workshops, workshops on case writing skills for everything. We need to have faculty development programs and uh, um, there should be like, uh, for example, if it is a phase one faculty, the MEO coordinator, if the person is from the clinical phase, then the phase one faculty will listen because they are not they are not one among us, isn't it? Usually a biochemist will not listen to a physiologist or it, it happens. So if the clinical person that uh, the person is going is going to listen for a common good, if we come together and uh, if there is some celebration taking place, then I think there is one way to bring the faculty together. The other thing is. We have to continuously evaluate the curriculum. And one more thing I, I'll tell you that we have to constant, we may make mistakes. For example, when we did the first time when I did the block, for one, uh, we, we called a person from the neuroscience to show some examples of EMG. We took a lecture on EMG also. Then I, I sat for all the classes. Then I found out that what that person was talking is actually not needed. Okay. The lecture is not needed. The practical is sufficient. So next thing we avoided the lecture. So for even when, I, when uh, asymptomatic disease was taken, I we gave it to a pharmacologist to talk just about the pharmacophysiology. He should not talk about the trade names or uh, anything else what is being taught in pharmacology. So I, we gave the objectives to the pharmacologist, and I sat for the class also. The, for, I sat for all the classes. So. Somebody I, I, has to encourage us, encourage us from the top. That is there. And, and so if there is a mistake, there is no need for anybody to feel happy about our point fingers at somebody. It is being done for the good of the students. We should never be afraid of making mistakes. There is always, we have to constantly evaluate and correct. There's nothing wrong in making mistakes. So that way we can overcome challenges. Thank you. I think you answered two of the questions. The last question which has come up. 
uh, that is which all blocks are usually taken in phase one. Yeah, I think three, four examples you have given for phase one. Uh, I am um, probably they are asking for a few more. See cardiovascular system, respiratory block, CNS block, endocrinology, reproduction, GIT and excretion. All this, wherever the dissection is going, the pelvis dissection is going to come together. The physiology follows that. Okay, whenever the thorax discussion is going to come together, the physiology will go to that area. So, on is an different? average for one year of uh, first phase, how many uh, blocks are there approximately? About six blocks. Six blocks. Okay. Now, I think no one is writing for the question. I have a question, which which is actually the thing which makes me a bit res. Uh, resistant to go uh, for an integrated thing. Say, for example, we are preparing an integrated module. We are assessing the module as well. Whosoever, whether a physiologist or a uh, biochemist assesses it. But who is going, who is supposed to keep the grades for that formative assessment, for that particular integrated module? That is the thing, because when we are giving grades to the student, or when we have to calculate from uh, the formative assessment, now, which module uh, grades, final grades will be going to which particular course or subject? This is uh, nice, but when we did the when we did the integrated module, say 40 marks was there for internal assessment. Okay. Uh, out of that 40 marks, this 10 marks came from the common integrated assessment. Okay. So that 10 marks was common, it was common for anatomy physiology and biochemistry. So I calculated all those grades and I asked the 30 marks only was given to biochemistry. I was I asked them to add this grade to their internal assessment. So that okay. way weightage was given for this integrated assessment. So that, so that, that ten, those 10 marks will be going to all the three subjects. All the three subjects it went. Okay. Okay. Then then still it makes a better one. Because um, many times when we have a case-based teaching, integrated case-based teaching, not an integrated module, a separate case-based teaching, uh, the main department, the one who initiates the process, uh, normally takes up the final score, irrespective whether the questions being asked for the case-based integrated uh, uh, component or a teaching learning session, which is almost for three hours duration, that is from uh, whichsoever department, like main coordinating department takes up the credit for that particular course. But I think now the NMC has given some topics as integrated, isn't it? Has specified they, some they have provided as... They have provided a list of topics, but... Uh, they provide a list of topics and they, we can ask questions in those topics. That way we will be satisfying. I think now it is easy. I think the NMC is giving a... NMC has given very good uh, guidelines, a timetable, yes. sharing, nesting and all. I think that is a good uh, example to follow. Very true. There's, there's one question more from the participant. How is the response from students for integrated teaching? Mm, students, yeah, it is. Uh, they like it. It is. Uh, we analyze the feedback. Very. I mean, when we started integration, yes, they said the objectives were met. They like the small group teaching, etc. Some of them like. Some of them liked lectures. Some of them did not like lectures. And uh, we prepared the source materials and all. See, initially, we so initially students did not know how to go uh, to the library to do the self study. All that they did not know. The first phase, they said that when they went to the third phase, they said that they were more well equipped. That's a great thing, and I'm always uh, positive to from the students' perspective because they are millennium students. They are more digitalized. They have so many things um, in their hand. And probably this is a good way to make them connected to the clinical aspect. I, I remember um, when I was uh, working internationally, one of the students uh, told me that I want to be a pediatrician. Why you are burdening me with the course of physiology? Okay. So, uh, like I told him, wait for some time and few of the cases you will understand that why physiology is important. And after completing that full uh, medical profile, uh, the student wrote back to me, although I had left the institute, that I understood that why physiology is important because even in the final year, I had to go for the physiology component. 
so that yeah so that way i think nmc has done a great job telling great the job. competencies and like uh, like we are supposed to learn about growth charts in physiology and we are yeah. supposed to interpret growth charts when we go to pediatrics. Yeah, so they've done a very good extensive job they have done. Very true. Very true. I agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the participants and special thanks to Dilara ma'am for such a wonderful yeah. presentation. Although it's a huge chapter in itself, but uh, within a precise time and with your own experiences and examples, it has cleared out to a very great extent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you all the participants for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks to Dr. Chetali also for all the tech part handling and streaming it on the YouTube as well. Thanks, Dr. Chetali. Uh, you're welcome and thank you so much, Dilara, ma'am. I'm also I'm a physiotherapist. And I'm working as an assistant professor uh, at one of the college in Ahmedabad. So this was also great, great learning from me also. For me also. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good, Good night, night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Now I'm closing the link. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.